Well, allow me to pray for our time in the Word together this morning. Father, we do come before you, and we ask that you would visit us in the person of your Spirit. And Father, we pray that because we know that the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to impact the people of God. So, Father, we pray that your Word would go forward, similar to the way that the rain falls, and it would accomplish your good purpose this morning, that you would do a good work in our hearts and in our minds. Father, we pray that you might grow us in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would conform us into his image. Father, we give our time to you this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, wouldn't you agree that we live in a day and age and culture that is very much like the days of the judges, where every man does whatever is right in their own eyes? And yet somehow people don't have any problem whatsoever describing themselves as religious. They're absolutely convinced there is a God or some sort of higher power that is leading, guiding, and directing them, determining what ultimately happens not only in this life, but also in the life to come. In fact, according to a Pew Research Center's 2008 study, 80% of Americans have absolutely no problem at all saying they believe in God or some sort of higher spiritual power. Did you know that in the United States, believing in God is common even among the religiously unaffiliated? So folks who identify themselves as atheists, agnostics, or as I quote, nothing in particular, even in that group, 72% believe in God. So 80% of the general population says they believe in God. 72% of atheists, agnostics, and nothing in particular believe in God. So the critical question that should immediately come to our minds is what God are they believing in? And even more important, I would suggest, what God are we believing in? And is it truly the God of the Bible? Because if it's not the God of the Bible, then what benefit could it possibly bring to our lives? And how could it ever help us experience life after death? If it's a God of our own imagination, there's no benefit at all. Which also explains, by the way, why the world and so many of us have no fear of God before our eyes. And it's why we're so comfortable doing whatever is right in our own eyes because there's absolutely no consequences to offending a God of our own imagination. Why is that? Because he always is in agreement with us. Why do I say that? Well, because many professing evangelical churches and its people are well known for their irreverence, their immorality, and their hypocrisy. So they're quick to say they believe in the God of the Bible, but that's not the God they proclaim and the God they live for with lives that back up their profession of faith. So let me just ask you, what makes you think your understanding of God is the right one? Why do you assume your perception of who God is is in line with reality? You see, what's so glorious about our passage this morning is that Jesus is going to lay out for us a beautiful picture of who God is so that we might understand Him correctly, that we might respond to Him rightly because of the God. The God of the Bible is not to be trifled with. He's a God of justice, righteousness, and yes, He's a God of wrath, of fury, but He's also a God of patience and kindness and goodness, and a God who can be known specifically through His Son, the Lord Jesus. So if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles with me. As we continue on in the book of Mark, we're in Mark chapter 12. It's on page 848 if you're using one of the Bibles in the chairs. I invite you to open to Mark chapter 12. Grab my outline that's in your bulletin. You'll see the... Th Three points that I have this morning, the forbearance of God, the fury of God, and the forgiveness of God. 
all packed into these 12 verses. Mark chapter 12, verse 1. Follow along as I read. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him. And went away. Now, let me just quickly remind you of where we're at in Jesus' life. Because last week we walked through the details of Palm Sunday. If you remember, Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, so his triumphal entrance, that was Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. Then, if you look, verse 12, we're told on the following day. So now we've moved to Monday. Jesus curses the fig tree and cleanses the temple. And then in verse 19, when evening came, he went out of the city. And verse 20, as they pass by, notice, in the morning. So now it's already Tuesday. Jesus has this short interaction with the disciples about what true fruit looks like in a person's life, right? Faith, prayer, and forgiveness. But then he walks into the temple and he interacts with a totally different group of people. Look with me at verse 27. It says he's interacting with the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. And they ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? Now, what are these things that Jesus is doing that's making them so upset? Well, obviously, it's the cleansing of the temple, right? I mean, he just walked into the temple on Monday morning of Passover week. Thousands upon thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem up at the temple for this celebration. And he walks right in as if he owns the place and he starts flipping over tables. (laughs) By what authority do you do these things? That's a good question. I would suggest that's a totally legitimate question. By whose authority are you doing these things? Who gives you the right? Now, Jesus obviously answers their question with a question which they can't answer. And I've told you a million times when Jesus answers your question with a question, you immediately know there's a heart problem going on, which is absolutely true. The religious leaders have a massive heart problem, don't they? Namely, they're claiming to believe in God, and yet they're rejecting the Messiah. They're rejecting the Son whom God has sent. And please note how the interaction in verses 27 to 33 has everything to do with John the Baptist. Verse 30, Jesus asks, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? What's the right answer to that question? Well, obviously, the baptism of John was from heaven. In other words, John the Baptist, the servant the prophet, was sent from God. So as we consider the context of our parable this morning, which comes immediately after this little interaction, meaning there's no break in the action. He's still talking to the same exact group of people. You need to recognize two major themes in this previous interaction. Number one, 
the question, by what authority is Jesus doing these things? He's going to answer that question. And number two, John the Baptist was sent by God, and not just sent, but killed because of his ministry, his declaration that people should repent and believe. See, that interaction frames our parable this morning. There's another context to this parable, and it flows right out of verse 1 because Jesus speaks to them in parables saying, a man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower, and he leased it to tenants and went to another country. Now, when you hear that, that probably means very little to you, but to the religious leaders, they would have immediately thought of Isaiah chapter 5. So let's quickly turn there so we can understand what they're understanding and see how this story matches that story. Keep your finger in Mark chapter 12. Isaiah 5 is on page 569. Isaiah chapter 5, let me read verses 1 to 7. See how closely these match up with what Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1, let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yield wild grapes, sour grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall not grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. You need to understand that Israel in the Old Testament was often referred to as God's vineyard. Verse 7 says, The vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel and the men of Judah. So when Jesus got up and said, A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug it, everybody knew he was talking about God and Israel. And the issue back then is the same issue as right now. Israel's not bearing fruit, right? Wild grapes are not sweet grapes. Instead, they're sour grapes. So again, they give the appearance of being good fruit, but they're a sham. They're they're a facade. They're the epitome of hypocrisy. It's bad fruit posing as good fruit. And what's the consequence in Isaiah Chapter 5, verse 5, God says, And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and devour it. I will break down its wall and I will trample it. Now what's terrifying back in Mark chapter 12 is that Jesus is one chapter away from declaring the 70 A.D. judgment Jerusalem will experience because they've rejected their Messiah's where the walls are broken down and the city is trampled. So do you see the similarities, obvious similarities between Isaiah chapter 5 and Mark 12? Well, flip back with me if you would. Seeing the similarities, let's consider the one major difference. The difference is the tenants, right? In Jesus' parable, he introduces this subtle but very significant little twist. Because usually in the Old Testament, God was managing the vineyard himself. But here Jesus infuses this idea of it being leased out to tenants. Now, tenants are something the people of Israel would have been very familiar with. Wealthy landowners leasing their land to farmers who work the land for them. As a result, they're expected to give the owner his rightful due of the fruit when it comes to harvest time. Which makes 
total sense, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's a very good system. So who are the tenants in Jesus' parable? Well, obviously, they're the religious leaders that Jesus is talking to right now. Verse 27, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. So God's the owner. The religious leaders are the tenants, and the vineyard is Israel. But verse 2 introduces a new character in the story because the owner of the vineyard sends a servant to collect his fair share of the fruit. And who are these servants? Well, they're obviously all the Old Testament prophets. In fact, in Acts chapter 7, at the stoning of Stephen, he gives a very similar summary of Israel's history, including their total rejection of the prophets. Verse 51 of Acts chapter 7, he rails against the religious leaders saying, you stiff-necked and stubborn people, you always resist the Holy Spirit just like our fathers, for which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed the ones who were announcing the coming of the righteous one who you just betrayed and murdered. So Stephen's summary is totally consistent with Jesus' parable. So it's one nonstop, consistent, and unwavering pattern of Israel's rebellion against God. So God created Israel, called her out from all the nations of the earth, and set his affection upon her, not because she was bigger or better than any of the other nations, Deuteronomy 7, but because he chose to love her and therefore called her to live gloriously different than the nations around her. But the entire Old Testament is a story of Israel not fulfilling her role. She's not bearing the fruit God desired and continually is going astray. Remember what Isaiah 5 just told us. God looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So what does God do in response? Well, he sends his servants, the prophets, to declare the word of the Lord to Israel and to call her to repent and believe. But how do the tenants respond to these servants of God? Well, verses 3 to 5, if you're back in Mark 12, they give us the answer. Right? Three very specific interactions listed, but many more referenced. The owner sends the first servant. Look at verse 3. But the tenants took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Verse 4. Again, the owner sends another servant. Servant number 2. But the tenants took him, struck him on the head, and treated him shamefully. Verse 5. Again, the owner sends another servant. Servant number 3. But this time, they kill him. And check out what it says next. And so it was with many others. Some they beat and some they killed. So this is clearly the story of Israel and her religious leaders rejecting God's prophet. Why exactly was God sending the prophets? Well, to call his people to repentance, to plead with them to respond rightly to God, to turn from their wickedness, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, and to bring glory and honor and praise to his holy name, which he rightly deserves. And how were the prophets actually treated? Well, from the Bible and from extra biblical history, we know that Jeremiah and Zechariah were beaten, they were put in stocks, and they were stoned to death. We know that Isaiah was sawn in two. We know that Uriah was killed by the sword. We know that Ezekiel, Micah, and Amos were all tortured and killed for their faith in the coming Messiah. So it's totally fair to say that Israel consistently and repetitively beat and killed the prophets of God. I think you've got to recognize, though, that these prophets were sent for Israel's good. Second Chronicles 36 sums it up really well when it says, verse 15, Therefore the Lord, the God of their fathers, persistently sent to them His messengers. Why? Because He had compassion on His people and His dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising His words and scoffing at His prophets until the wrath of God rose up against His people. 
until there was no more remedy. So the consistent pattern in the parable, and I would suggest in real life, is to reject the servants of God. So what does the landowner do? Well, verse 6 says he decides to send his son, his only son, his beloved son. Verse 6, he still had one other, a beloved son, so he sent him to, say, to them saying, surely they will respect my son, my beloved son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and all the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. Now, there's no doubt here Jesus is speaking about himself, but what nails it down is this son language. And we've heard this son language all throughout the Gospel of Mark already, right? Mark starts chapter 1, verse 1. It says, this is the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Who is he? The Son of God. We also heard it at Jesus' baptism, chapter 1, verse 11. And the heavens are opened and a voice comes booming from the sky, right? God the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then it comes up again in the transfiguration. Chapter 9, verse 7, where God the Father again declares, this is my beloved Son. But then he says this, listen to Him. Now just think about those words in light of this parable. Listen to Him. To him. See, God's been trying to get these people's attention for centuries, thousands and thousands of years, one prophet after the next, pleading with them, calling to them, and even commanding them to repent and believe, to look forward to the coming Messiah. But now he's here. And God is saying through all of these miracles, all of Jesus' life, this is the one. He opened the heavens to tell them, This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. Respond to Him. Recognize Him. Repent and believe in Him. Yet, the haunting words of verse 7 in our parable. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. That's exactly what they did. Verse 8, and they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. The reality of the suffering son. We've seen this coming all the way through the gospel of Mark, haven't we? In fact, I want you to see the inclusio that he's purposely giving us. If you would, keep your hand again in Mark 12, but flip back to chapter 3, verse 6. Look at what chapter 3, verse 6, Mark tells us. Look at chapter 3, verse 6. Mark tells us, And the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, against Jesus. What was the purpose of the counsel? On how to destroy him. Now flip forward to chapter 12, verse 13, right? The verse immediately after this parable. Look at what it says. And they, who's the they? The religious leaders sent to him, to Jesus, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians. Same group we just saw in chapter 3, verse 6. What's the purpose? Why are they sending him? To trap him. They can take him and kill him and throw him out of the vineyard. That's the plan. Now, before we move on, I want to pause for a moment of application and just think about this picture of God that we're given here in these first eight verses. Because I think it's a glorious picture of the forbearance of God. I mean, can you even imagine what you would have done if your feet were in the shoes of this landowner? I mean, How long would you have tolerated the tenants responding to your servants like this? The first, they beat and sent packing. The second, they punched in the face and treated shamefully. The third, they tortured and killed. I mean, can you even imagine making it past the first servant? Can you even imagine as the owner tolerating that kind of treatment? 
when all you're trying to do is collect what is rightfully yours. Absolutely. We wouldn't have tolerated that for a moment. Right? right? Like, like a good American, you'd have sent one servant, heard the report, called the cavalry, and demanded what is yours. Either you would have sent an army to get it, or you would have called a lawyer, and you would have sued them. Right? That's what we would have done. Yet after all this, and many honor others, the owner sends his son. And again, he doesn't send him with a team of Navy SEALs. He doesn't send him with Green Berets. And he doesn't even send him with the Avengers. Don't you think that would have been a better plan? Avengers are clearly true. What does he do? He sends his son on a mercy mission. He's still offering terms of peace. Can you even believe that? It makes you almost want to question the owner's sanity, doesn't it? I mean, how did he go with how did it go with the last eight guys? It didn't go very well. All beaten, shamed, and killed. Well then how do you think it's gonna go for your son? Why in the world would you put your son, your only son, your beloved son, at risk? Why would you do that? You know where I'm going with this. And I'm going there on purpose. Because I want you to get a hold of the unbelievable mercy and the kindness and the forbearance of our God. He is so gracious, so loving, so long-suffering that it opens him up to the charge of being reckless and foolish with his servants and his son. But doesn't this parable correct what I hear so often that the God of the Old Testament is somehow violent, vindictive, and mean? Are you kidding me? This God, this God described in chapter 12, verses 1 to 12, is he quick to anger? Is he fast to fury? No, I don't think so. You need to know if that's your thinking this morning, then you haven't read the scriptures rightly. And you have, you know nothing about the God of the Bible. See, Psalm 103, in my mind, gives a much more accurate summary of who God is. The psalmist says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Notice the clause, to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers we are but dust. Dear believer, I want you to glory in God's unbelievable forbearance towards you this morning. And I want it to stir up thankfulness and praise in your heart. Because at one point in your life, you were totally indifferent to God. Right? And, and you were no different than these tenants. You were an enemy of God, refusing to acknowledge God as Lord and denying to give Him what is rightfully His. What did God do in your life? He sent gospel messengers to you. My guess, if you're anything like me, you didn't just immediately come to your senses, bowing the knee, repenting and believing in Jesus. My guess is you continued to do your own thing, walked your own path, followed the course of this world, living in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And yet, God kept sending messengers, whether it was your friends or your parents, your pastor, or your school, Sunday school teacher, or just the guy who sits next to you at work. He just kept sending servants of God. And yet you kept refusing, not wanting to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. 
And he would have been totally just to stop sending you messengers. But he kept offering mercy, offering you grace and peace and love and forgiveness until finally the lights went on and you repented and you believed. Beloved, remember where it is that you've come from. It should make you abundantly thankful. God's unbelievable forbearance with you. And doesn't that make you want to be merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and forbearance toward others? Because the way God treated us is exactly how we should treat others. In fact, it sets the standard for how we should forbear one another. Let me just ask you, how do you, how do you react when someone sins against you? How do you respond to people who wrong you? Are you patient? Are you kind? Are you gracious? Do you assume the best of other people? Do you go and talk to them about how they've sinned against you? If they don't see it at first, do you lose your patience and get angry with them? When your spouse sins against you, how do you react? When your, your kids sin against you, how do you react? react. When your friends or your boss or your co-workers or the people in this church sin against you, how do you react? Do you jump all over them? Are you incredulous that they could do such a thing to you? Or do you run through all the ways in which you never act like that because somehow you're the standard of godliness? You see, we all have this amazing ability, innate nature, to be patient and kind and gracious and long-suffering with ourselves, giving all sorts of room, always assuming the best, and most often thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. But we don't do that with others. Dear believer, let's glory in God's grace and mercy and kindness and forbearance toward us. But then let's turn around and offer that same kind of grace and mercy and kindness and forbearance to others. Which is not a call to excuse sin. But it is a call to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace in this particular church. That's point number one, the forbearance of God. Let's move on to point number two, the fury of God. We're obviously not going to spend as much time here, but I do want to walk through the obvious foolishness of the tenants, the foolishness of Israel's leaders who, by the way, actually understood what Jesus was saying, and the foolishness of this world. Just think with me for a moment about the unbelievable behavior of these tenants because it's absolutely crazy, isn't it? I mean, the vineyard isn't theirs. They, didn't, they don't own it. They didn't pay for it. They didn't buy it, build it, or create it, or in any way, shape, or form do anything that would give them legitimate claim to it. It is not theirs. And yet they totally act as if it is. That's crazy. And I think what is equally crazy is they seem to not think the landowner is going to do anything about it. They just assume if they kill the servants and they kill the son, the property will be theirs free and clear. But there's a consequence to that kind of behavior, isn't there? And it's right here in verse 9. The question is asked, what will the owner of the vineyard do? Here's the answer. He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. So there is a just judgment coming. The tenants will be destroyed for their wickedness. Well, that's just a story, right? Now think about the foolishness of Israel's leaders because they actually acted just like these tenants throughout the entire Old Testament. And the truth is they're still acting like that right now, right here, right in front of Jesus, the Son, even though they've got all the facts and evidence to see Jesus clearly. 
I mean, just think about the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is teaching with authority, casting out demons, healing the sick, cleansing lembers, and even saying to the paralytic, take up your bed and walk. When did he say that? Where did he say that? He said that right in front of the religious leaders so they might know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of Man, and that he has all authority to forgive sins. That was in front of the Pharisees. Mark is very specific about that in Mark chapter 2. But what do they do with all that? Do they acknowledge Him as the Son? Do they repent and believe in Him? No, they make plans to kill Him. Do you see their utter foolishness to not respond rightly to Jesus, to see His miracles, His power, His authority, His compassion, and His forbearance, and still not acknowledge Him as the Son of God, who's pleading with them to repent and believe and be saved? And it's not as though they don't understand what he's talking about, right? I mean, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus told us the purpose for parables. Mark chapter 4, verse 12, he told us the purpose for these parables. He said, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn away from their sins and be forgiven. So here when Jesus starts teaching in parables, you just assume they won't understand. You're assuming they won't get it. They won't see. They won't perceive. They won't hear. They won't understand. Otherwise, they'd turn from their wicked ways, their arrogance and their pride, and they'd be forgiven. But you get here to chapter 12, and they actually do understand what Jesus is saying. Look at what it says in verse 12. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people... Why? For they perceived that he told the parable against them. You see how clear that is? So they totally get that Jesus is talking about them. They know they're the tenants in the story. They killed the prophets. They killed John the Baptist. And now, right now, they're planning to kill the son. They completely understand that God's forbearance will ultimately give way to God's fury. And he will come and destroy them, the religious leaders, and give his vineyard to others, namely the Gentiles, those who joyfully repent in Jesus. I, I, I've got only one explanation for that kind of foolishness. Here's the explanation. Sin makes you stupid. You should write that down. I'm just going to pause. You should think about your life. How often don't you just do stupid things? Sinful things that you know are absolutely wrong. Why do you do that? Sin makes you stupid. So stupid, you choose a path that ends with your own death and destruction. That's stupid. I'm going to head in this direction. What's the end of this direction? Oh, death and destruction. Still a good idea. I should head in that direction. That's stupid. Hey, let's go this way. What's this way? Hey, this is the path of forgiveness in life. Why wouldn't you go in this direction? No, I think I'll choose death and destruction. That's stupid. That's stupid. Proverbs 16, 25. There's a way that seems right to men, like killing God's prophets and killing God's son. But its end is the way of death and destruction. But the religious leaders are not the only ones who are foolish here, are they? I mean, the same could easily be said about the world in which we live. Everyone who lives in God's world, everyone who lives in God's vineyard and yet refuses to honor God as the creator and sustainer of that world, of that vineyard, could easily be described as foolish. Do you know Psalm 14 says, the fool says in his heart, the fool says in his heart, the fool says in his foolish heart, there is no God. I'm just suggesting by definition, according to the Bible, atheists are fools. 
I'm not making a personal comment about their intelligence. I'm saying from a spiritual wisdom perspective, they're fools. Romans 1 also talks about people who know deep down in their hearts that God exists. For they see His invisible attributes, His eternal power, His divine nature in all of creation, and yet they suppress the truth about God in all unrighteousness. Then verse 21 says, For although they know God, they do not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him as God. Why? For their foolish hearts are darkened. Claiming to be wise, they become fools. How? By exchanging the glory of God for all sorts of wicked idols. So deep down, we all know God exists. We know it by the external evidence of God's creation, and we know it by the internal evidence of our own consciences. But foolishness, apart from God's good work in our hearts and minds, we ignore these facts, and we live our lives like these tenants, thinking we can somehow do whatever we want, whenever we want, and never be held accountable for it. That's foolishness. The fact is, that we will be held accountable for it. Yes, verses 1 to 8 clearly teaches the forbearance of God, but verses 9 and 12 also teach the fury of God. That those who do not respond rightly to God ultimately will experience the wrath of God. And that's true not only for the tenants in the parable and the religious leaders of Jesus' day, but that's true for every single one of us this morning. Romans 1 makes that clear because we all exchange the glory of God for worthless idols at least at some point in our lives, right? So what are we supposed to do? How do we take advantage of the forbearance of God and avoid the fury of God and finally, ultimately, and most importantly, experience the forgiveness of God? And how does God make that happen for us? Well, the answer is right here in verses 10 and 11. Let me read them again. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, I so desperately want you to see the glorious wisdom of God that's packed into these two short verses. A quote from Psalm 118. Because, if you will, it's this little mini parable. Jesus is obviously both the rejected stone and he's the cornerstone. But notice the order of those events. Because Jesus must first be rejected by the builders, so the religious leaders, which he's already predicted three times in the Gospel of Mark, if you remember. Chapter 8, 31, 9, 31, and 10, 33. But just listen again to chapter 8, verse 31. Listen to what he just said to these people. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. Rejected by who, Jesus? By the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes. That's the same group he's talking to right now. Jesus must first be rejected. He must first be condemned, mocked, spit upon, flogged, killed, crucified, dead, and buried. That's exactly what the religious leaders are going to do to him in the next three days. This is Tuesday. He's crucified on Friday. But then the rejected stone becomes the cornerstone. The glory of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And notice what verse 11 says. This was the Lord's doing, and it was marvelous in our, in our eyes. Now, I can't help but think of Peter's sermon on Pentecost, when he not only condemns the religious leaders for all they did in rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and their Mas- promised Messiah, but at the same time, he testifies about the marvelous work of God, his sovereign hand over the entire event. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. You can turn there if you'd like to. Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works, signs and wonders that God did through him in your midst. Then he says this, As you yourselves know. You saw it. You experienced it. This Jesus, 
delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Do you see it? Sovereign hand, sovereign work of God, which is absolutely marvelous, and the condemnation of the religious leaders who are absolutely wicked, all for our glorious salvation. But Peter's not done preaching. So if you would, turn with me. If you didn't turn to Acts 2, you should have done that, but I didn't make you do that. So now I'm going to make you turn to Acts chapter 4. This one I want you to see for yourself. Then we'll wrap up this morning. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verses 10 to 12. I want you to see how Peter pulls all of this together. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Peter says, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, there's the rejected stone, whom God raised from the dead, there's our cornerstone. By him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. You're the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. How do we take advantage of the forbearance of God, avoid the fury of God, and finally, ultimately, and most importantly, experience the forgiveness of God? It's right here in Acts 4.12. By believing in Jesus. His death, his burial, his resurrection for our salvation. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. If you're here this morning and you're not exactly sure what you believe about God, I can't imagine a more helpful passage for you to know than this one. You might have walked in here this morning with a totally wrong understanding of who God is. Or maybe you don't even believe God exists. Or maybe you think He's weak and He's worthless just because of the wickedness that runs rampant in our world today. But you need to understand this passage teaches that it's not that God isn't powerful. He is. And it's not that He won't judge the wicked. He will. We're just in a season of mercy right now, a season of God's glorious forbearance. But you need to know that season isn't going to last forever. So he's not judging your sin, your wickedness, and your rejection right now, but he will ultimately either when you die or when Christ returns. But right now, he continues to offer you his glorious grace. That if you but believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be delivered from God's fury and enjoy the sweet reality of God's forgiveness. I appeal to you this morning, don't interpret God's inaction as weakness or or, or some proof that God doesn't exist. It's simply His forbearance. He's giving you time to repent and believe in His Son. In fact, 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises, as some count slowness, but He is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, experiencing God's fury, but that all should reach repentance and experience God's forgiveness. I appeal to you to repent and believe and be saved. And for you, dear believer, I simply want to make one quick and obvious connection. That if we're still in the season of God's forbearance, which we are, then in Jesus' parable, we're now the servants being sent out to proclaim the good news of the gospel so that others might repent and believe and be saved from God's fury and experience God's forgiveness. Which means, number one, We should not be surprised when our evangelism efforts are met with some sort of hostility 
Right? We should expect that. Read the parable. <laughs> it's a little bit scary, isn't it? You can also go and look at Hebrews chapter 11. You get a whole list of how people were rejected because they preached the gospel. We should not be surprised when our evangelism efforts are met with some form of hostility. 1 Peter 4 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you as though some strange thing were happening to you. I love that language. Nothing strange is happening to you when people reject the gospel when you share it with them. That should be our expectation. Number one, hostile responses to the gospel should not be a surprise. But that also means, number two, we must persevere in our efforts to share the gospel with others. This is not hard to appeal to you on. All you have to do is think about your own salvation. Praise God that people didn't go give up on you. Right? They, didn't, they didn't share with you once and then just walk away. Yeah, he's a fool. I'm so grateful for the people in my life who were persistent with the gospel, who kept appealing to me. I had one older gentleman in my town. I knew him since I was four years old. Every time I would hang out with my buddy, his son, he'd get out of his Bible, he'd pull it out, him and his wife, and we'd interact at dinner on the scriptures. And he'd share the gospel with me. You know, when I turned 18 years old, I totally rejected it. Every single time I thought, you're a real nice old man, but I'm not interested. 18 years old. He came to my house after graduation. He sat down at my table, and he appealed to me to see the reality of my sin in my life, which was evident and obvious. It was all over the place. And to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. I still rejected it. So he prayed for me. Persistent prayers of a righteous man accomplish much. And the Lord was gracious and kind to me, persistent to come and get me. We must persevere in our efforts to share the gospel with others. Praise God that people didn't give up on us that they willingly pushed through our attitude and our arrogance and kept sharing and pleading and praying for our salvation, that they were forbearing of our foolish rejection and kept pushing for our faithful acceptance. Why would they do that? Because there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. May God give us the grace to not be surprised by trials, but to persevere for people's souls. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would do a good work in people's minds and hearts this morning. First and foremost, Father, I pray that we would be overwhelmed by your forbearance. But I also pray that we would recognize that if we choose to reject the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, then we should expect God's fury. Father, do a good work in each and every mind and heart this morning, that we would run to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men by which we might be saved and experience God's forgiveness. And Father, I pray that you work in every mind and heart, that we would be motivated to share this good news with others, that we would rightly expect hostility, but that we would persevere joyfully, gladly, willingly for the salvation of people's souls. Father, do that good work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.